Question 4. This question is about lead chloride. Question A. A student prepares a sample of insoluble lead chloride by mixing equal solutions of two salts in a beaker. Part 1. Identify two soluble salts suitable for making lead chloride when mixed together. So lead chloride is an insoluble salt. To make insoluble salts, we are going to need two soluble salts reacting together. So to get lead chloride, which is an insoluble salt, we are going to need two soluble salts. One of them have to be containing chloride and the other have to be containing lead. So it will be lead something or something chloride giving us lead chloride plus the other two elements that we use for the soluble salts. In order to do this, you must be familiar with your solubility rules. And in your solubility table, you will learn that all nitrates are soluble. So a safe choice would be lead nitrate. And now we need to find something for chloride. Almost all chlorides are soluble except silver and lead. So we can't use silver or lead here. And we know that sodium, potassium and ammonium salts are always soluble. So we can use any one of these for the second soluble salt. I'm going to use sodium. So there you go. We've got lead nitrate and sodium chloride. Part 2. Write the ionic equation for the formation of lead chloride by mixing aqueous solutions. Include the state symbols. Okay, let's do this step by step because you are given with quite a lot of marks which are 3. We have here lead chloride which is PbCl2, meaning that it is a reaction of Pb2 plus and Cl minus. Doing this will give you your first mark. Next, there is 2 chlorine here so we're going to have to balance it by putting 2 over here. That will give you your second mark. Next, you've got to state the symbols. Ions always present in aqueous state. And since this is an insoluble salt, this is solid. And that's how you get a complete three marks. Next, list the steps the student should take in preparing a pure sample of lead chloride from the mixture in the beaker. Lead chloride is an insoluble salt. I want you to take a screenshot of this. For soluble salts, these are the keywords that you must have when explaining how to prepare it. And for insoluble salt, it's this. React, filter, wash and dry. Next, question B. The student carries out an electrolysis experiment on molten lead chloride using the apparatus shown in figure 4.1. Chlorine gas forms at the anode and escapes from the apparatus. So the chlorine gas escapes here. So this is your setup and we are using molten lead chloride as the electrolyte. Molten means that there is no presence of water, so no H plus or OH ions. Let's first identify what ions are present in the electrolyte over here. So you've got Pb2 plus and Cl minus. When conducting electrolysis, you will always have two electrodes, one which is anode and the other is cathode. Over here, we can't really identify which one is anode or cathode because there is no terminals on your power supply. But let's assume that if this is positive terminal and this is negative terminal, then this will be anode and this will be cathode. Cathodes are negatively charged, therefore it will attract Pb2+. An anode is positively charged, meaning that it will attract chloride ions. That's why you see chlorine gas formed at the anode, because the chloride ions will lose electrons to form chlorine gas. Okay, now let's look at the questions. Part 1. Explain why lead chloride needs to be molten before it will conduct electricity. If you take physics, you will also learn about why a certain compound has to be ionic or why it has to be molten in order to conduct electricity or even heat. And the answer is always the same. The reason is because there needs to be free moving electrons to carry the charges from one place to another. Next part to write down the ionic half equation for the reaction occurring at anode. So at anode, the chloride ion is attracted and it will form chlorine gas and two electrons. Electrons will flow from positive terminal like this to the negative terminal. So as you can see, this is anode since it is connected to the negative terminal. So at anode here, you can see electrons leaving. That's why you have electrons here after the arrow. Next, part 3, state the test for chlorine gas. To test chlorine gas, we will use a damp litmus paper. And since chlorine is acidic, it will bleach the litmus paper. And if you are asked for observation, chlorine gas is a greenish-yellow gas. 
Therefore, what you will observe is a greenish yellow bubbles. Don't mention your observation chlorine gas because you cannot see a gas. But what you can see is a greenish yellow bubbles, meaning that it is a chlorine gas. Next, describe what is observed at cathode. At cathode, you have your lead 2 plus being attracted. So since it is at cathode, it will receive electrons to form lead. So this is your product. This is not your observation. Your observation, since it is a lead, you will see a shiny gray solid being formed over here. Question 5. Chemical reactions can involve transfer of thermal energy. Part A. State the term used for the transfer of thermal energy during a reaction. Again, this is a very straightforward question. As long as you know the theory, you should be able to answer this question. The term used is the enthalpy change. You will see this when you draw energy level diagram and the change of H, which is the enthalpy change, is used to represent the transfer of thermal energy. Either it is an exothermic or endothermic reaction. Question B. Tetrachloromethane gas CCL4 reacts with steam, as shown. The reaction is reversible. As you can see here, this is reversible. It says that the forward reaction is exothermic. Okay, part 1. State what happens, if anything, to the rate of forward reaction if the concentration of CCL4 is increased. And then explain your answers in terms of collision theory. Over here, we are talking about rate. Rate meaning the speed of a reaction. So we are not going to look into equilibrium. Pay attention that this is based on rate of reaction. Rate of reaction will increase if the concentration is increased. So stating this will give you your first mark. And then you have to answer in terms of collision theory. So why does the rate of reaction increase? The rate of reaction increases because when the concentration of CCL4 is increased, now there are more particles of CCL4 to react with H2O. If there are more particles per unit volume present, this means that there will be more collision within the particles. So this is how you answer based on terms of collision theory. Just pay attention whether the question is testing you on equilibrium or rate of reaction. Next, part 2. State what happens to the position of equilibrium, if anything, when the pressure is increased. Explain your answer. So now they're testing you on equilibrium. When being tested on equilibrium, your first mark is always obtained when you mention whether the equilibrium shifts to the right or shifts to the left. You don't say equilibrium increases or decreases. So there are three factors that will affect the position of equilibrium. One is temperature, number two is concentration, and number three is pressure. To check how pressure will affect the position of equilibrium, we're going to look at the number of moles for the product and reactant. For reactants in total, there are 3 moles. And for reactant in total, there are 5 moles. So as a comparison, the reactants have fewer molecules. If pressure is increased, the equilibrium will shift to the side with fewer molecules. And the fewer molecules here is on the left. So your first point, you will mention the position of equilibrium has shifted to the left. And the reason is because there are fewer molecules on the left compared to the right. And that's how you get a complete two marks. Next, part 3. Figure 5.1 shows an incomplete reaction pathway diagram for the forward reaction. On figure 5.1, insert the formula of the reactants and products. This is very simple, you're just going to write them like this. Next, draw an arrow labeled activation energy to show the activation energy. Okay, activation energy is always from the base of the reactant until the hump of the graph. So you label this as your activation energy. Next, label theta H to show the transfer of energy in the reaction. Transfer of energy starts from the reactant level until the product. So you can show the energy change has reduced and label it as theta H. Next question 4. Define the term of activation energy. So I'm going to define it by referring to the cost specification. It says that activation energy is the minimum energy that colliding particles must have to react. Next, part 5. State one way in which the activation energy of a reaction can be changed. So this is based on rate of reaction. 
In rate of reaction, you will learn that there are a certain factors that can be done to speed up the reaction. And one way of doing that is by adding catalyst. And how does catalyst help in speeding up the rate of reaction is that catalyst can help reduce the activation energy. So we can change that by using a catalyst. Next, question C. The equation for the reaction between tetrachloromethane gas and steam can be represented as shown in figure 5.2. Table 5.1 shows some bond energies. So you've got all the bonds here and the value of energy. Use the bond energies in table 5.1 over here and the change of enthalpy value, this one, for the reaction to calculate the HCl bond energy using the following steps. So we are going to require to find the bond energy of HCl. The first step is we're going to calculate the energy needed to break the bonds in the reactants. So here you have all your reactants. So I like to do this by calculating all the bonds that I have. So I have 1 CCl, 2, 3 and 4. So I have 4 CCl bonds. And next is the HO bond. 1, 2, 3 and 4. So I have 4 HO bonds. So we're just going to add it up together. CCL bond has a bond energy of 340. So we'll just substitute that. And then OH bond, which can also be written as HO, has a bond energy of 460. Okay, now you just press these values into the calculator and you will get 3200. Okay, next. We are going to calculate the energy released when the bonds in carbon dioxide form. Carbon dioxide have 805 kilojoule energy. And we have... 1 and 2 carbon dioxide. So 2 carbon dioxide bond and carbon dioxide bond has energy of 805. Just use your calculator and you will get 1610. Next, we're going to calculate the HCl bond. Okay, the value obtained here is the energy for reactant minus the energy of product. So we'll write this in an equation. The energy needed to break the bonds in the reactants was 3200 kilojoules. So if I rearrange this, I can calculate the energy needed to form the bonds in the product, which is 3330 kilojoules. So the energy here is 3330 kilojoules, meaning that the bond formed here, which is 1610, added up with 4 bonds of HCl is going to give me this value. So 4 bonds of HCl is equals to 1720. So 1 bond of HCl is 430 kilojoules per mole. Question 6. A homologous series is a family of organic compounds whose members have similar chemical properties. This is a chapter from organic chemistry and some homologous series that you must learn are these four. Make sure you are familiar with them. Now question A. Give two characteristics that are the same for all the members of a homologous series. All homologous series have the same functional group, same general formula and shares the similar chemical properties. Next, question B. In terms of structure, state how one member of a homologous series differs from the next member of that homologous series. So let's use an alkene as an example. So the first carbon alkene will be CH2. And the second carbon alkene will be C2H4. And then it's going to be C3H6. So from one member to another member, the difference here is CH2. And this happens for all homologous series. You will also see in your course specification that it differs from one member to the next by a CH2 unit. All these questions seem pretty straightforward. So as long as your theory is good, you will be able to answer these questions easily. Question C. A, B, and C are organic compounds. A has the molecular formula of C12H24. So 12 to 24 is directly times 2. So it must be CNH2N. This is an alkene. B has the name tetradecane. It ends with an A and E in. So this must be an alkene. C has three carbon atoms and is in the homologous series with the general formula CNH2N COOH. COOH is a carboxylic acid. Question part 1. Name the homologous series each organic compound belongs to. So it's alkene, alkane and carboxylic acid. 
Next question part 2. Name C and draw its displayed formula. So C is a carboxylic acid which has 3 carbon atoms. So 3 carbon atom means the name should start with, with a prop. So this is a carboxylic acid. We are going to add a prop into it to become propanoic acid. Now we are going to draw the displayed formula. For carboxylic acid, I like to start by drawing the functional group which is COOH like this. We know that it has 3 carbon and there's already 1 carbon over here. So we are left to draw another 2 carbons. And each carbon has to be filled up with hydrogen atoms. Next question D. Amino acids are a homologous series where each member has the general structure shown in figure 6.1. The R side chain, this, contains carbon and hydrogen atoms only. Part 1. An amino acid has a relative molecular mass of 100 entry. Deduce the formula of the R side chain in this amino acid and show your working. Okay, so the entire molecule has a mass of 103 and we are looking to find the mass of R. We can first add up all the masses that we already know. We have 1, 2, 3 and 4 H add up with 1, 2 carbons and 1 nitrogen and 2 oxygens. The molecular mass for hydrogen is 1, for carbon is 12, for nitrogen is 14 and for oxygen is 16. This will give us 74. If the whole thing is 103 and we already calculate all this is 74, we're just going to take away 103 with 74 to get the one left here which is R, which is 29. But we are not really done because we need to deduce the formula. Now that we know it's 29, we have also another information that this only contains C and H. So let's split it accordingly. Now we know that one carbon atom has to be attached with 4 hydrogen bonds. So let's say if this was one carbon atom and 4 hydrogen bond, that will give us a mass of only 15. So it cannot be CH4. What if we change this to 2 carbon, giving us 2 carbon and 5 hydrogens. 2 carbon means that the mass would be 24 and 5 hydrogens the mass will be 5. Add this up together, we will get 29. So the formula of R is C2H5. Next part 2, state the name given to the natural polyamides formed from amino acid monomers. Again, this is theory. The name given to the natural polyamides are proteins. 